11th annual Innovation Challenge. I can't believe we've had that many of them. But this is an exciting evening. Please grab a snack, have a seat. This is the time when our teams who have great ideas for businesses get to present them to an excellent panel of judges who you are about to meet. Uh, and this is Manhattan College uh, Shark Tank. So we have spent quite a bit of time uh, making sure uh, this event uh, reaches, uh, reaches its goal. And one of the goals is to help our students actually start businesses that can continue. And out of this competition, we've had several businesses that are continuing. We have a vintage clothing line that is still going. Uh, we have that pajama company made in New Jersey, right, led by one of our entrepreneurs. We have a couple more in addition. So part of that is providing a little startup money. And when this competition began, something like 11 years ago, we awarded $250 in prizes. Tonight it will be $10,000, and I'd love to keep raising more of that, so we need to double and triple that. But the idea is to help students really think about what can be a viable business. Uh, we should give a round of applause for our students right off the bat. Let's do that. Many of them started this competition back at the launch in September, and then we had workshops in marketing, in finance, in creating your own idea, and we will meet Winston Peters, who coordinated those workshops. Uh, but that has been very exciting to see their ideas grow over time. All of this is done, uh, all of this is done outside of class, so it's really impressive the motivation of what these students come, uh, come up with. So the prizes tonight will be $5,000 for first place, $2,500 for second, $1,500 for third, and $1,000 to audience favorite. So everyone in the audience, here in the room, and live streaming on YouTube, yes, that's you. You, where are you? You, uh, you too can vote for the audience favorite. So as you watch, think about which one, uh, which one you like, okay? And you two YouTubers, I'm glad you got to sit on your couch while we're here, but that's okay, we understand. Uh, a couple of thank yous. I really want to thank, first of all, Mike Kelly, who is one of our judges here, 1980. Mike Kelly has been a terrific uh, supporter of this competition for many years. It's like year four or five at least. Uh, and has made possible our entrepreneurship center on campus uh, we really couldn't be here without Mike. And we're gathering more people around Mike, so if you'd like to get to know Mike and support what we are doing, by all means, talk to him tonight. Uh, another terrific supporter is Tom Deegan, a graduate of Manhattan College in engineering. He couldn't be with us uh, tonight, but he has a terrific company as an entrepreneur. He started called ClearShares, that uh, has a, it's an investment platform for ETFs and we will look forward to meeting him in the future, but he also uh, really supported tonight's event. So I really wanna thank all of you who have supported us financially. And now I'd like to introduce Winston Peters, who coordinates this event as well as leading our Entrepreneurs at MC initiative on campus. He is an entrepreneur himself and uh, runs a company called My Uber Life Consulting, uh, helps companies figure out, uh, figure out their business strategies and how best to meet their market. So he's kind of living what he teaches students to do, but he really mentors students carefully. He is a terrific adjunct professor for us in marketing. So Winston has become really part of the community. All right, Winston, take it away. We're almost ready to get started, yay! Thank you, Dean Gitson, for that. Um, before we get started, uh, something you forgot to mention. This year we're having a digital program, so if you want to if you want to scan this QR code for our to follow along with the program, just scan that QR code online as well as here um, inside uh, for the innovation challenge. Before I introduce the judges, I want to make a special acknowledgement. I just want to say for our special guests from Cardinal Hayes High School. You know we've. Uh, part of the mission of Entrepreneurs at MC is not only to work with the college students here inside of the campus, but also explore outside of the campus as well. So, welcome, Cardinal Hayes. 
Uh, let me see if this is working. Okay, maybe this is not working. Okay, okay. So, a little, a little bit of background about this year in terms of our programming for entrepreneurs at MC. At MC, we had a lot of great programming here on campus as well as off campus. As you can see, we had actually one of our judges, uh, Gina Serpils, had gave a great workshop on uh, the founder's journey. We had the commissioner of the uh, the commissioner, I always get this wrong, of the D DCWP, which is the Consumer Workers uh, Protection for New York City as one of our guest speakers for Women's History Month. And we also had, in terms of bridging that gap between engineering and entrepreneurship, we had uh, Yana Aranda, who is the senior director over at the ASME, which is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, as part of our workshop series, giving workshops as well as speaker series here at Entrepreneurs at MC things that we're doing on campus, but also what we're doing off campus as well, which is part of the mission, as well as really going into the high schools and giving, uh, giving students a more head start on entrepreneurship. You know, as we said, you know, worked with Cardinal Heath High Schools as well as LaSalle Academy as well. Um, moving on. Right now, so again, getting ready for this innovation challenge will give you a little bit of the background in terms of the judging criteria. So the judging criteria will fall into these five categories in terms of the value proposition was really is, does this product help solve a clear problem? And then really looking at the marketing and, and customer development, really understand does these startups actually understand who their market is, who their customer is, and is there a real custom product customer fit? And I really understanding the economics of their business as well, like what the cost of their products, the cost of their cost structure as well, as well as the revenue that they're looking to generate, as well as the org organization and execution of their idea as, as well as some of their established businesses as well, and then just their, prese their presentation style, like how well are they delivering their message um, as well. So. Without further ado, I want to introduce the judges, the, our panel of expert judges. Um, as I mentioned before, Mike Kelly. Mike Kelly is the managing partner of Yellow Threads Ventures, which funds early stage and other growth-oriented companies. Mike also serves on the board of the Ronald McDonald House Charity as well, which does amazing work for, for young people, for kids. I want to keep these intros short so that we can get right into th the pitches. Uh, Gina Serfalis, who I mentioned earlier as well, is the founder of Cooking Cosmetics, a company that offers hands-on cooking classes to teach students how to use healthy foods and natural ingredients to maintain their skin. Um, she's also born and born and raised within the Bronx, so Bronx proud as, as well. She, uh, she has held a management position at top performing beauty companies spanning personal care ingredients as well as fragrance categories, thus before she launched her own business, Cooking Cosmetics as well. Um, our third judge, we have Dave Thompson, president of Spring Capital, a private investment company. Most recently, he was the owner of Thompson Marina in Malefield, uh, New York. David has spent the last 12 years pursuing entrepreneurial opportunities and investments in commercial, commercial real estates. And last but not least, we have Marshall Strawbridge, also a Manhattan alum, uh, who is the Director of Small Business and Community Outreach at the Bronx Economic Development Corporation, BXEDC, where he leads their small business development and grant making initiatives. Marshall has spearheaded impactful initiatives in the Bronx, such as a $1 million storefront improvement program, as well as a $1 million Bronx Green Action Challenge. Those are our judges for this innovation challenge. Give it a round for the judges. And so, look, and something special about this innovation challenge that I'm really excited about, hopefully it works, cross, cross your fingers. Um, this year we actually have one of our, our student startups is actually a student from abroad who's actually pitching from Spain right now. So six hours ahead, so right now it's midnight where he is right now, so hopefully everything works out smoothly for his virtual pitch. So right now, um, in our 11th year, now the Innovation Challenge is now international. So it's so something that we're excited about as well. So we have an amazing round of student startups from Slay Spray, Apparent, um, Carbon Clear, uh, the, House, <coughs> the House of Temple, as well as Chips Sunflower Seeds. 
And without further ado, we're going to start it off with Chip Sunflower Seeds as the first presenter. Hold on, before, before you come up. Before you come up. Before you come up, let me just make sure I get you up here properly. Yeah, I was I was actually going to gonna share that, but they can they, I'll let them share that as well. So coming up first is Chip Sunflower Seeds presented by Oliver Pudvar as well as Noah Jensen. So everyone at home and everyone in the audience, one thing I did forget to mention in terms of how this pitch is going to be um, going forward is the student startups will have six minutes to, to pitch and then the judges will have six minutes to ask questions uh, after your pitch. So I just wanted to just give everyone what that order would actually be. So again, chip sunflower seeds. Good evening everyone. My name is Oliver Pudvar and I am the co-owner of Chip Sunflower Seeds and I'm also a global business studies and management co-major. And my name is Noah Jensen, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Ch Chip Sunflower Seeds, and I am a marketing major. So what is Chip Seeds? Well, it's pretty simple. We're a sunflower seed company, but we've got a chip on our shoulder. You see, we're Vermont-based, we're cooking out of our own kitchen right now, and we're college students running it, and personally for Noah and I, we're both injured, and we play mid-major baseball. But you know what we say to that? Good. We are the underdogs, and so are all of you. Always have that chip on your shoulder. So to touch on the backstory a little bit, in 2022, we began this company in a high school business class. That's my buddy Chip in the corner. He's the co-owner. Uh, so we started this business off completely as a maple sunflower seed company where we were actually creating our own maple syrup in our own uh, sugar shack, as you can see in the top right of the first box. And then fast forward two and a half years later, we became an LLC and we have a store ready product, as you can see on the table right there. So what sets chip seeds apart? We've all heard the saying, proof's in the pudding, but at chip seeds, we believe proof is in the flavor. As you can see, a competitor as Chinook Sittery, they have the aesthetic, and they have the beautiful name of Cinnamon Toast and Hatch Chili, but they don't have the reviews. Their, their flavor profile does not match what the, uh, what the customer wants and needs, and that's what Chip Sunflower Seeds provides. Also, merch, we have that drip, where you could always, or should I say chip, that you could always wear on your shoulder. So cost structure. It costs about $1.70 for us to make a bag. We sell each bag at $4. That gives us a net profit of $2.30, which is a net profit margin of 57.5%, which is great. This is also off our most expensive bag to make, which is the Maple Mania, given that it's all local produced and made in our sugar shack. So our revenue streams, we currently sell a four pack online a solo pack and a custom amount if you're trying to do a bundle. And we also sell merchandise that you saw on the last slide. We sell hoodies, trucker hats, polos, and much more to come. Um, other revenue ideas, subscription, reoccurring seed purchase to always have your favorite chip sunflower seed right at your back hip. Bundle ideas, seeds and merchandise combos so you could always wear that chip on your shoulder. And we have a custom generator idea that we're gonna touch on throughout the rest of this presentation. So we created a cash flow forecast for 2024. If you look at the money out, you don't see any startup costs. That's because this is our third year of uh, business. And so we already uh, tackled those earlier on. Uh, and then with the money in, something significant to look at is in June, July, and August. Uh, you can see that we're uh, predicting increased seed sales. And that is because we believe that this is going to be a crucial time for us with um, co collegiate summer leagues going on as well as youth baseball tournaments. And Noah will also touch on that in the next slide right here. Yeah, so back, backing off all these points, uh, we pride ourselves on our relationships with not only NCAA division athletes from division one to division three, but also with uh, major league athletes from independent baseball all the way to major league baseball. You can see in the left-hand corner here, this is a Major League Baseball player that Oliver and I are friends with that are shouting out chip seats. Um, and in the bottom right-hand corner, there's one of our uh, personal friends that plays at the University of Alabama um, in the SEC shouting out chip sunflower seeds in their bullpen. 
So here you see we have an Instagram following of 259 followers. And yeah, I know what you're thinking, it might be small. But we've reached 1.4 thousand accounts in the past 30 days, so it is growing. Um, and we believe it is growing through Pull to Bowl with PUD. So just given a uh, brief description, this is a podcast that Oliver and I created where we will go from the left field foul pole to the right field foul pole in the beginning of games and interview not only our teammates but opposing teammates on you know the love of the game and having them rate their favorite chips sunflower seed. So SWOT analysis, I'm going to briefly go through this, I know we're short on time. Uh, strength, our unique flavors, maple mania, the only of its kinds. You put it in your mouth, you taste Vermont immediately. Weaknesses, production cost of the customized flavors. This idea of the custom generator, we're gonna to touch on the next slide, still unknown. Opportunities, partnerships with leagues or other businesses. Oliver is gonna to touch on that on the last slide. And threats, competition. We understand it's a saturated market already with big name competitors. So we have to have a unique sales strategy in order to gain this market dominance. And that's what we're gonna get into in this next slide. The long-term goal of this customized generator. This is going off of a 44 Pro Gloves idea. If you guys are not aware what this is, it is a customized generator online that you can completely customize your glove from style, fabric, um, and color of your pleasing. So that's our idea of what we want to incorporate in chip seeds. Customize flavors, customize uh, merchandise for whether you want to bundle for a team or whether it's for an individual person. Um, and having capital is key, right? We don't know how much this is gonna cost. So we want to use the capital from this innovation challenge to invest into this generator. And so the last slide I'll quickly touch on. So with the MLB already having a seed sponsor in David's, we believe that college baseball is the route that we should take, especially with new things coming up such as name, image, and likeness deals where we can capitalize on uh, getting college athletes under the chip seeds name and then we basically work up the ladder with them as they get drafted, go to the minor leagues, and then hopefully one day play in the majors. And then right now, so we had mentioned that our products are locally sourced. The only thing that isn't being locally sourced is our sunflower seeds. We're getting those from California, and one thing that we think could really help with the money from this competition is hopefully getting our seeds into uh, a garden or creating our own garden in Vermont so we can easily have um, these seeds at our disposal. Thank you. Where do you source the maple flavoring? Um, yeah, so I can, I'll go back to the slide. I, we touched on it quickly. Um, so this is actually where we're uh, getting the maple syrup from. We have our own sugar shack uh, in Vermont. Where in Vermont? Uh, Shelburne, Vermont, yeah. which is right outside of Burlington. Um, and so we're creating our own maple syrup right from here. We even, uh, you know, we, we collect the buckets um, ourselves. Um, so we're we're basically doing the whole process. You're of tapping creating. the trees. Yep, everything. Taking the sap and cooking it down. Exactly. Yeah, it takes about ten hours sometimes to get just a gallon of syrup. So. And that's your most popular flavor. Yes. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Hi. Great presentation. Thank you. Are you concerned or have you thought about any um, environmental issues with response in terms of sourcing your seeds from California? We know our climate is a little bit wonky these days. Totally. Yeah. So um, that's also, so our two main goals uh, are not only doing this custom generator, but also to locally source our seeds. Because um, shipping them out from California, we want to reduce our carbon footprint and we want to be a more sustainable company. So we know that with this capital, we could maybe invest in a more localized garden or manufacturing plant, sustainable manufacturing plant, um, to actually reduce that carbon footprint from importing the sunflower seeds. Thank you. Um, I understand your channel of distribution, but I didn't really understand your channel of awareness. Like, how are you going to get out of this one particular channel? Um, yeah, so we know that we kind of uh, target a specific niche, 
with the sunflower seeds and getting you know a lot of kind of that baseball player culture so we want to also build this brand of having the chip on the shoulder to make it bigger about a sunflower seed to not only make our only channel just baseball specific where a college youth um or ex-baseball players but target all the underdogs in this world that want to buy into the culture of having that chip on their shoulder to kind of buy into that bigger idea that you know what it, it might start a, we might have started a small local um, sunflower seed company but we're rooting and we stand for all the people that you know that have grown up as the underdog and they're fighting to make it out so we're in Girl Scout cookie season right now yeah whether you realize it or not <laughs> and um, I just wondered had you thought about fundraising as a channel of distribution because if you look at the popcorn category they do a lot of sports promotional selling to raise money and certainly little leagues do a lot of promotional uh, work and I just wondered if that had you thought about that yeah so we have actually two things about this so actually today um, I was given the idea so back back when I played high school baseball we sold popcorn um, just like you were talking about. And so uh, we, we're trying to work with uh, the high school that I went with, I, I went to, um, to actually, instead of them selling popcorn, sell chip sunflower seeds, because it works perfectly with baseball. Um, and then another thing uh, along those lines is that uh, we had to take the slide out because uh, it was too long, but um, we had this social initiative that we were working on, and we were actually going to coach a, um, a little league baseball team uh, this summer um, and so I think yeah and with that little league baseball team we're gonna coach it with no pay um, and we're gonna actually be able to uh, use it as kind of a marketing strategy as well um, so not only are we kind of giving back to the community where you know we grew up in but also um, we're gonna be able to put chip sunflower seeds logos um, on the kids jerseys um, as well as a wooden board out in center field of the Little League stadiums uh, saying chip sunflower seeds so we thought it was a cool way to kind of give back to the community and also kind of build our brand great presentation gentlemen um, I want to make sure that I'm clear on this before I ask the question but um, my understanding is that a significant amount of this award would go towards you all building out the custom generator, the glove generator. Could you help me understand, that, that's correct. Yeah. Um, could you help me understand how that is connected to um, selling more bags of sunflower seeds? Um, or if that's the intention, if, if that's something you're hoping to open up a new revenue stream by selling more gloves, or if that's connected to selling more sunflower seeds by like brand awareness? Yeah, so I think maybe I might have been a little bit unclear, um, but the so we're not actually selling gloves. Uh, the customized generator. This was just what stemmed that idea. Um, so this idea of the custom gloves is kind of what got our minds thinking of like how can we get a customized approach. But we're not actually selling gloves. It's going to be a customized generator for our seeds um, from customized flavors, customized bags, um, customized merchandise. So we can do okay. Let's do a customized generator for Manhattan College. Right. So we build Manhattan College seeds, Manhattan College apparel um, with the chip on their shoulder, kind of making like that customized approach, but. The glove was just what the idea stemmed from. Thank you, Chips Sunflower Seeds. Having a chip on your shoulder. Uh, next group up will be apparent. Uh, presenting will be Teresa Do Dolan as well as Brielle Scavone. Scavone. The floor is yours. Okay. This is heavy lifting here. Right. Heavy lifting? <laughs> Where's this? I'm sorry. Uh, the here we go. The clicker is here. While again, while they are um, rating their scores again, 
But thank you, thank you, Chips and Flower Seeds. Again, for our for our innovation challenge. Again, some of our groups are having have concept ideas, and some of them have existing businesses, and that's a really good part of the innovation challenge is seeing what's already in the market, and seeing what new things can come into the market as as well into um, into the market. So again, looking forward to hear a parent, which is a concept idea that's mm -hmm. looking to be launched hopefully soon um, as we wait for the judges to, to finish and and we are we're good so now I will turn it over to a parent hello everyone my name is Brielle Scavone and I am a senior studying finance hello I'm Teresa Donlin and I'm a senior studying accounting in the Amalia School of Business so good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Teresa Donlin. My name is Brielle Scavone, and together we are a parent. a parent. Being your own boss can be an electrifying experience, but let's be honest, it can also be pretty overwhelming managing income generation as well as expense management. Every moment counts, and as a business owner, time is your most valuable asset. So what if I told you that we have created the perfect solution to streamline your expenses effortlessly so you are prepared and confident going into tax season? Introducing Apparent, your end-to-end -end solution for expense management. So what's our goal? To take the guesswork out of timestamping, categorizing, and grabbing digital receipts, ensuring you feel prepared for tax season. So how does it work? Our intuitive app allows individuals who file as a 1099 to effortlessly track their business expenses. Our app leverages APIs to communicate seamlessly with online vendors, timestamping and categorizing your transactions in real time. Plus, we take care of the digital receipts so you don't have to deal with any of that annoying paperwork. From meals, to education, to travel, to technology, we have got you covered. Are you a realtor off to meet a potential buyer? Track that mileage. Are you off to meet a client over lunch? Track that meal. We are here to ensure that your process is as effortless as possible. So, let's talk options. We have a premium and a free option. Looking at our premium option, for just $7 a month, we go the extra mile. Your purchases are meticulously tracked, and your digital receipts are effortlessly grabbed. Now, as a boss, we realize you're constantly on the go, so all of your purchases are not going to be with online vendors. Not a problem. The POS systems of today are brilliant. Just be sure at checkout to send your digital receipt through email or text, and we'll handle the rest. Also. We offer quarterly reports that show your expense trends as well as industry data and insights to help you grow your business. Plus, based on your budget, we provide suggestions for cheaper alternatives, allowing you to optimize on your business expenses. So, when tax season rolls around, all you have to do is send this data to your accountant stress-free. On the other hand, our free option allows for manual transaction input and digital receipt upload ensuring flexibility for all our users. And if you're anything like me, saving money is of the utmost importance. With our budgeting and suggestion feature, we will provide you with cheaper alternatives via alert on the app so you don't have to worry about anything. We have you covered and your process will be as effortless as possible. We are here to be a lifeline to be to young entrepreneurs like yourselves, independent business owners, freelancers, and private contractors alike. So, our target market is clear, and our strategy is simple. We plan to advertise on freelance service marketplaces, as well as form connections within the e-commerce and real estate industries. The expense tracker market is booming. According to Future Market Insights, Inc., 
the market is projected to be at just shy of $22 billion by the conclusion of 2033, and a parent is poised to ride that wave of growth. So, our goals are ambitious yet achievable. We plan to begin beta testing in June of this year with a sample size of around 30 individuals. And we are confident that within the next six years, we can grow the apparent community to well over 2,000 users. In conclusion, we are not just here to save you time and money, but we are here to revolutionize the process of spending, tracking, and achieving just one transaction at a time. Thank you, judges. Thank you faculty, friends, and family for joining us today in making the expense tracking process so seamless with a parent. Uh, good presentation. I didn't see any comparison to Concur or any of the existing products, how does this product differentiate itself in the marketplace? Yeah, so there's other expense trackers on the market, uh, but what makes Apparent really niche is we are for like the independent business owners, the people who are doing this on their own, the underdogs, um, and I think that was always like one of the big founding principles of Apparent is we're trying to equip uh, the small business owners and the people who are doing it on their own with the tools that big companies already have at their disposal. Um, there are, of course, other expense trackers on the market, but they're really not doing it like we do. Um, while our free option does have the manual like digital uh, receipt upload, a lot of the expense trackers are not seamlessly grabbing those digital receipts like we intend to do. Um, also, that um, budgeting and suggestion feature is kind of a niche uh, quality of a parent where we're trying to um, look at different applications that users have at their disposal to try to find those cheaper alternatives so they can optimize their business expenses. And also we would have the quarterly reports kind of like, like a business is typical, typical annual report so people can reflect. And also they're provided that market insight to give them that extra edge. Um, so a parent is definitely niche, but expense trackers, it's certainly a big market. Um, but yeah, we're not, um, Definitely not new in this market, but we're, we're definitely unique. Well, I think the quarterly is important because you got to file your taxes quarterly. Yes. As an independent. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. Um, how do you propose to market this? How do, you, how do you get your 30 participants for your beta testing? How are you, what's your marketing plan for this? Yes. Oh, we can both hear. Um, well, for one, uh, we, I, um, yeah, we both have friends who are like entrepreneurs. I have some friends who have their own online businesses. Um, I know some private contractors. I know individuals who file as a 1099. So we, to a, a degree, have that kind of letter in, of intent uh, with those individuals. Uh, but like we mentioned in the slides, like we hope to form connections with people in the e-commerce industry and the real estate industry. My mom is an, a realtor, so of course I ran this idea by her. And something like this I know can be very valuable because as someone who's working for themselves, you're constantly on the go. So having something that's streamlined, um, so you're not having to go through all that paperwork. Um, and either, like I have two friends, one who like throws all the receipts in a drawer and then kind of tackles it later. And then I have another friend who's very meticulous and diligent about uploading her receipts, but this is just seeking to make it easy and streamlined and simple. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think you want to add. Yeah. Um, to add on to what Teresa said, I think our, I know our initial intention was to create something for college students first and foremost. Um, this is a less expensive alternative to an accountant, although this does not replace accountancy whatsoever. We want to create a program that will help encourage entrepreneurship even further amongst college students. And just as a, maybe you partner with your local chambers of commerce or accelerators, incubators, where businesses are coming in fresh and could possibly use this. Okay. Great point. Really nice job on the presentation. Uh, what, at the end of the period, whether it's a month or a quarter, do you have an interface for that data into Excel or uh, 
QuickBooks or something like that? So that is also something we are considering um, as a feature of a parent, um, the, like Excel, as you mentioned. Um, also, as you saw at the end, like people or users can send this to their accountant, but we also wanted to create kind of like a, an easy way if they want to like use TurboTax or upload this to any other platform uh, to handle their taxes, because I know e-filing is like on the rise now. Uh, but yes, an Excel feature where this is like, um, can be shown is definitely something that we hope to implement. Great, thanks. Thank you all. Um, what is the um, what are the costs associated with scaling? You mentioned going from thirty beta testers to two thousand. Um, what does uh, scaling to to that capacity look like? What are the expenses associated with that? Yeah, so at the start, finance apps, there's like a, a definitely a big range for how much it, it can start um, to develop an app like this. We found anywhere from like $10,000 to $90,000. Uh, $90, um, but like uh, we found it typically it can land around like $40,000. At the beginning, we hope to have like a beta app, which would maybe utilize one um, like online vendor, something like maybe Uber, so we can just kind of see how this works. Um, so that would obviously cost a lot less. Uh, but going forward, we think with you know a, um, a startup cost of around forty thousand dollars to develop the app, and then overhead is going to include like the service Plaid, like we mentioned in the slide, which would manage all the banking data as well as people's passwords, and then the cost of some of the APIs that we need to use to communicate with the other applications. Um, that's some stuff we'd need to confirm more with a programmer. Um, but from what we can understand in like our preliminary research, uh, we believe that it would cost around like $40,000 to get this app started, and that we would be able to break even in around three years with the subscriber growth that we showed. But like looking back at that, we are confident that we could almost double each of those numbers. Um, but yes, like the overhead cost is something that we need to definitely tie down a little bit more. Um, but yes. Thank you, a parent. Um, and even also right now, just think, talking about that startup cost, even right now with AI, AI generation in terms of creating apps, it may, maybe even be lower than the $40,000 that you're actually um, estimated right now. Um, as the judges get ready, the, our next presenter uh, will be uh, the House of Temple. As the, as the judges get ready and finish tabulating. I think we're almost almost there, almost good to go. I see cracking open the, the sunflower seeds. You gotta see, see, if, to go see, see the proof is in the pudding, see or the proof is in the maple. See what it's all about. So, <laughs> awesome. So again, we have uh, Tyler Temple from the House of Temple getting ready to present now. Hello everyone, how are you guys doing today? That's good to know. All right, my name is Tyler Temple. I am a computer science major here at Manhattan College. What my brand is, is the, called the House of Temple, nicknamed Temple. It is a luxury 3D fashion house that tries to integrate technology and fashion together seamlessly into making sure that the industry is innovative on all approaches, not just the luxury sector. So, as I mentioned before, what the House of Temple is, it's a luxury 3D fashion brand that redefines the traditional approaches towards fashion as a whole, incorporating a 3D fitting software that helps users to be able to integrate themselves as an avatar into being able to finding out the refitting size to making sure that they are able to know exactly what they're getting before it gets ordered to their door. Now, who am I? Again, hello. See that handsome guy right there? Yeah, that's Tyler, that's me. I am a computer science major here, again. I'm the CEO and head designer and founder of the House of Temple, hence the name. And now the problem that we're facing in the industry is the innovation lacks 
Industry, an industry as fashion is always traditional. You never look at any approaches towards anything different. You see the same thing being reintroduced every different set of the year, whether your garments are made from polyester or cheap garments or cheap materials, and you're coming up to the same thing. Ugh, they don't have my size. Ugh, this model is a size zero, but I'm a size 10. You know, whatever the issue may be, there's nothing innovative to help change or adapt to what users are looking for as a whole when they're spending a bunch of money consistently every single month. As well as the fashion industry, it dominates every aspect of what's going into, overall, the consumption of fast fashion. You're looking at Sheen, you're looking at Timu, you see a lot of the time that they're adding into the environmental degradation of the industry as a whole and not really incorporating anything that can help adapt to what we're looking for as an innovative future and a cleaner future. Now what's our solution? 3D fitting through technology and luxury. No mobile app development and web tech integ integration, as well as 3D developed content via Unreal Engine is what I've developed, and as well a 3D fitting software that helps users to be able to integrate themselves, as you see here, and finding out where it's too loose, too tight, and just the right fit, depending on what you're looking for. Now our competitors, we're looking at Ears von Herpen, as well with a design here, their avant-garde designs for 3D printing, 3S4, a New York-based brand that has a futuristic design for 3D printing, as well Balenciaga as being one of our competitors. I know you may know some of them, the weird designs. They have developed some sort of 3D technology as well with 3D printed garments. As you can see, a big trend in what they're going for, but nothing really that touches towards what the user is looking for specifically. Now, why us rather than our competitors? Looking at advanced 3D development content that helps us to be able to co cut costs and as well to be more creative in terms of our designs and our approach to being able to reach the user specifically on what they're looking for, for not only a brand that has a cultural connection, but as well as a brand that helps them to understand their body and whom they are for when they're paying all this money towards up front, they know what they're getting. Now, the progress up to date. House of Temple, named Temple, has been founded as a C Corp in Delaware. We have a fully designed collection our um, first collection coming out is Tragedy. We have 24, or actually no, 14 collections, 20, 28 collections in 14 seasons. Right here we have initiated theme collections, 3D models already set, set apart, as well as trademarking pending, manufacturer partners, as well as our office space that has been set in Rockefeller Center. As well, we have collaborative events with multiple designers, 3D as well. And as we have Mercury Banking as our selected um, banking app, as well as we've done successful beta testing of our website with the collection pending this May. Now our pricing strategy, now you're probably wondering how much it's gonna cost you. Again, it's a luxury brand. You're paying for what you're getting, right? The House of Temple ranges within Atelier and Formal, who are known as Couture, some of you may know, and as well as Designer. The Temple Basics is for more affordable ranging. So your t-shirts, your hoodies, your basic branding that helps you to understand exactly what you're getting and therefore making sure that you're still incorporated with the brand, but if you don't have the money to spend $10,000 on a dress, it's okay as well for Temple as a whole for ready to wear. These are designer garments that are going on the runway that you're able to look at and kind of admire every other day. As well as our financials, and typically for what we see here for revenue, if we're going through a full ranking of all the garments in terms of full product and full house of materials, these are how we intend on wanting to sell out our products. Now typically, say a shirt could cost about $500 we sell for pricing. And then we look at how much the manufacturing cost costs. It costs about $200 to make. So our profit right there is 60%. That's a clear example as well. We're looking at our insurance, our supplies, our accounting materials, our renting, leasing, marketing, as well as our gross profit and revenue overall with our losses. And the market as a whole, over the course of time, between 2020 and 2023, we've seen a massive increase in the luxury sector, not only in China, but Europe and the US as well. That coming from online shopping and in person. Now, our first growth phase and where we are right now, a small fashion line with limited collection releases and beneficial to New Yorkers because this is a New York City brand that intends on incorporating and going further into the markets where the fashion industry really does dominate, such as Paris, Tokyo, and London. Now, our marketing strategy for our game plan, we have social, blogs, SEO, marketing, influencers, website, and email. Our customer demographics, Annually, typically people make about $75,000 as well for the luxury ready to wear sector for our shopping habits, the geographic locations such as metropolitan areas, as well as the interest in towards collaborative and innovative fashion brands is where we look for when what they're seeing. Now the companies that we work with to help us with being able to integrate all this stuff and to go further. Kyoto Creative for our marketing, the Evans Group as our secondary source for our studio, 
as well as Spring Studio, which is in the Garment District right now, is our, for our production team is. Industrious is for helping us with getting our office space in Rockefeller. And WATC Studio is for helping us with getting our basic garments for the Temple Basics. Now, our investment goals over the course of time, we have our pre-revenue, what we're trying to raise, which is $100,000, eventually going to Series C, which is up to 10, 000, uh, 10 million. And that is Temple, but I know the question you guys may have. You guys, you guys have everything? Yeah. Yes. This one? Yes. Excellent, excellent presentation. And thank you for bringing this one mm -hmm. back up. Um, I'm curious to know uh, how the 3D custom um, approach to developing fashion affects the timeline between someone getting the garment that they're looking for and um, ordering it and, and getting it? How does that compare to um, the, the fast fashion option? Yeah, so how it compares is, hopefully it's still on. how it compares is typically when people are searching through online, you're making sure that the one thing that they're obviously going for is how can this garment be up to what I'm paying for? A lot of brands typically they incorporate a lot of cheap materials and then try to quickly sell you off the 3D garment proposition showcases that we're spending more of our money into developing the quality of the garment rather than trying to get a nice fancy photo for you just to look at and admire. A lot of brands typically do that. They'll push out a bunch of money in marketing. How, how much long, how, so if I can order a pair of pants and it'll be here Friday, how yes. much longer am I going to wait for a pair of 3D custom fit pants? You're still waiting. You're uh, not still waiting, but you're getting them around the same time. Okay. as normally as you would shop okay. on a regular website. So we have the options for fast shipping, that's about two days, going up to a week, depending on whatever you, your preference is. So just so I understand, so this is a consumer-based product. Yes. So if, if I want a suit and Dave wants fishing clothing, mm -hmm. we can go on the site and order the same thing and you're gonna have a variety of types of cloth to, I, I don't understand how you're going to do that. Yeah. So mainly what we're doing is that we're showcasing the garments that they would be physically to you in 3D format. So it saves us more time from trying to market out and trying to get this clothing just as a perfect picture and whatever you can see in a studio and focusing on making sure that our production team is able to incorporate the garments with the best quality materials to you and that's whatever's in stock. And so we don't try to get our stock up to like 100 or over 1,000 for MOQ, but we try to limit it to where we make it as exclusive as possible in some way that allows for people to say, hey, this isn't going to be incorporating into the landfill that is fast fashion, but as well making sure that you're able to get your garment you know, on time as a normal brand would. So I'm going to give an example. Pink, the men's shirt manufacturer, mm -hmm. they make custom shirts. You put your dimensions in, and then in some time, Marshall, like three to four weeks, you get a custom shirt. Mm -hmm. So... How, I understand how they do it. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how you're going to do it when you have jackets, pants, shirts, T-shirts. I don't understand the, the manufacturing. Can I show you model. a little bit of what I mean? Yeah, please. Yeah. So, when you're ordering something... This is how it's gonna look. When you're going on there, you're looking at the photos, you're like, okay, I like that shirt, I like that dress. This is how things are gonna work. You're gonna go through, you're gonna say, hmm, I like the black one, right? Then we go into the fitting. Let's pick a female model, let's pick her. Pick a triangular body. Let's go in for here, check, change the height up. Let's go in inches, because you know. And then we'll say maybe she's about 154 pounds. And there's also some additional data as well that you could put in here that can kind of help and incorporate that. Just give me a quick second. And then what you do when you click that, it's going to showcase a 3D model here that's going to fit through. And then what you're going to look at, you're going to see here where it's too tight and too loose. From there, it helps you to pick out what type of garment you think would be best for you, depending on what you're going for. So if you're wanting something that's a little bit more looser, this is how it's going to look. It's going to show you where it's too tight, too loose based on your recommendations. And then you can put in your favorites. You can either put in your bag and get ready just for it to come to your door. And then you can also adjust accordingly if you need to make any other positions. So if you change weight, change weight one week and then lost it, 
it doesn't have any benefit or any fault to you. And then you can also take some photos here as well if you want to showcase, showcase the people that you've got this little avatar that has the garment that you like the most, and then you go on from there. Can I ask a different question? Yes. Why wouldn't you rather sell this as a software? Why wouldn't you rather sell this as a software product? For instance, I'm familiar with Rent a Runway. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Rent a Runway has garments. Mm -hmm. They have thousands of garments for pr primarily women, and they have you know anything from casual wear to formal wear. Why would you rather sell that so your software to Rent a Runway? So when Gina rents. Um, leisure wear for her weekend away, but on Sunday she's going to a wedding. She knows with more certainty that that garment is going to fit her particular, um, excuse me, frame. body style, right? Frame. frame. Thank you. <laughs> and the reason why is mainly because we want to keep our competitive narrative that we can make sure that this brand is associated with this technology and making sure that our mission as a whole is being focused on being innovative and being cost efficient as well as trying to be sustainable. A lot of brands may try to incorporate this and not follow that suit and it can have some issues in terms of who did what and how did where. We want to make sure that we attach everything to what our mission is as a whole, is to sell garments that are not only innovative, but as well are quality controlled, rather than trying to be amongst a lot of other brands that may just use this technology just to get more sales into continuing the fast fashion scope. Okay. One more question. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Could you go back to your competitive landscape, if you don't mind? Yes. That, you kind of took my question here a little bit of why not invest it in with, with fashion industries or, so your, on your competitive landscape, your differentiation is that, you, why, yeah, why, this, why is, is, this is it. Oh, yeah. So your point of differentiation here, they're, because they're all using this 3D printing technology, mm -hmm. and your point of differentiation is? 3D developed content and 3D fitting software. That's our differentiation. Their concept is typically maybe in some aspect they'll showcase their garments in 3D format. Got it. But, and most likely they won't do anything beyond that. That's mm -hmm. just more of a marketing approach just to kind of get people to look a little bit more closer. It's kind of a way of teasing someone saying, hey, you know, we're doing something different than what we usually do, but then that's it. Okay. Okay. So your differentiation really is from a not wasteful yes. perspective. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, the House of Temple. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you for the cooker as well. So, so right now, as the judges are deliberating right now, scoring rather, um, we're going to try something new. We're going to try and have our virtual student pitching uh, from abroad, from Spain. Let's see. Trying to get this as I trying to figure this out. Gerard, can you hear me? Okay, I'm trying to. Can you hear me, Gerard? I am trying to figure this out. Maybe I have to lower the volume. Oh, there we go. Maybe I'll just do that. No, that doesn't work either. Okay. Okay, I'm on mute. Can you...
that's like We're just trying to figure out this technical issue. I'm trying to get him with that. Give us one moment as we try and figure this out. Please, please have refreshments while, while we figure out this technical issue. I think <laughs> as we figure out this technical issue, we're going to move forward with the next group, and we'll come back to you, Gerard, okay? All right. So we're, we're going to hold off on Gerard, and we're going to move on to our next team, which is, I'm going to need to which is slay them away. Hold on. As I get your presentation up. Right. Again, pardon the technical pardon the technical issues. We're trying something new. But again, with without further ado, we have Anna Bert Burnett. Anna Burnett with Slay Them Away. Hi, thank you so much for coming today. My name is Anna Burnett. Um, undergrad, I was a political science and psychology minor. And now in my second year of my MBA for uh, business school through the O'Malley School of Business. So this has been a very big learning curve for me. So I'm very excited to present Slay Spray. Sorry, okay. I'm gonna do the best I can with this, okay. Yesterday in New York City, multiple women were targeted and punched. One in three women will experience gender violence and Slay Spray is here to help. 
Unlike leading products like Mace or a Taser, Slay Spray offers an obtainable alternative. Although pepper spray can be bought, you must be 18 legally, and many young adults take public transit. When buying mace in New York City, the buyer must sign a form stating that they are of legal age and that they don't have any felonies or assaults. This can be invasive and can cause a roadblock for people who do not have access to self-defense tools. With its Y2K trendy design and spray paint bottle attached, you will be sure to mark your attacker in style. With bright, colorful choices, the paint automatically marks the person to the public, unlike Mace. With a Bluetooth optional fob attached, I also hope to build an app to list helpful resources for healing and justice, pushing for education, and building communities. After working in the IT lab on campus, I was so impressed with the fact that Femtech products can be very useful to the communities of survivors and people looking for connection. Thank you, Professor Peters, for giving me the vocab of Femtech to me. Femtech is a term that refers to the tools for tech and software aimed at women's health issues, and I want to build an online community of assault victims. For example, if you type in 11001 on an app, it would have a list of mental health resources for that individual in Long Island, which builds accessibility to life-saving resources and can, and I hope, to be connected to the FOB. Through my digital marketing class under Professor Cosme, I was able to build a website, slayspray.store, which you can pull up on your phone now. I will say this is an educational website, so you cannot buy the product, but you can bring this up on your phone, and the domain is active. If I won this challenge, I would invest on the product be and the website and build the inventory. Sorry. For the spray paint itself, I have already contacted Machine Studio, which is a small business that is based in Las Vegas that carries small, portable spray paint bottles. The thing that makes Slay Spray different from your leading self-defense tool is you can mark your attacker, A, in the way that you want to, but B, it's a legal alternative if you cannot reach Mace. When I was a freshman in Manhattan College, I didn't know where I could get Mace or a taser. People told me some back store, maybe, or asked someone, this is a way that people People can get it and destigmatize it. All right. Um, I have a TikTok where I have over 2,000 followers, which isn't, some may say that's not that big of a start. I've been studying trends for a very long time, and I have been able to get reach of 2.8 million views on one of my videos. I have many polls within the comedian community, as well as models under Alex Angst, Audra Johnson, and Trevor Brabrandt, who I can potentially collaborate to post this on their social media. So, so far for Machine Studio, the bottle itself is $5, and I hope to buy this in bulk. And if you look on the slayspray.store website, you will see that I want to sell an aluminum bottle of spray paint for $24.99 and a plastic version for $19.99. This could, uh, and it is about $7 to produce because I can get a keychain through Alibaba, which is a supplier that I've also had contact with, and it's about 50 cents per trendy keychain and about a dollar for a Bluetooth tracker. Um, and it would be about $5 per each bottle of spray paint. So this would be about $7 to produce. So with the aluminum bottle, it could be an $18 profit. And with the plastic bottle, it could be a $13 profit. I think it would be amazing if I had someone partner from the IT department. I learned a lot from Quasi Bodkin on campus and his coworkers. I believe what sets Slay Spray apart is its dire need to protect women and that I utilize social media as a competitive advantage. I have built an online community and built a network of inspiring people who would be willing to market the product. I have studied trends extensively and my highest viewed video has been 2.8 million views. Personally, I would want to implement the product and get ready with me outfits to normalize women protecting themselves and others and also to open up the conversation about assault. I would like to start this business in the home setting and then eventually grow my community for postgraduate life. As a survivor of assault and strangulation, I wish I had this product to protect me. And as a member of Model United Nations for the past 10 years, becoming president and also president of mock trial in my high school, I will continue to advocate for the lives of survivors. Everyone has the right to feel safe. What's wrong with slaying while doing it? 
And lastly, this is dedicated to my Aunt Karen DeSanto, lover of shoes, cursing, cutting hair, and teaching students how to speak English at university with her masters, and most of all, love her children. She taught me to stick up for myself and to look good while doing it. And I have a prototype over here. So this would be the plastic design. Um, this is just a mock-up, but you could potentially attach it to a keychain or your belt. Um, this keychain itself, it has a noisemaker because first, I don't want you to spray someone with spray paint if you do not have to. This could be a problem. The first measure is to pull this weapon right here, which makes an incredibly loud noise in your attacker's face with also a whistle. If you go on TikTok, there was actually 10 girls attacked New York City yesterday and were punched in the face. So I think this is an obtainable product that can help people. Okay, I'll blow, do you want me to blow the whistle? No? Okay, thank you. I don't think I was gonna speak advice from that. Sorry to get up and close and personal. If thank you guys would you. like to look at it. I would. Thank you so much, this was great. Obviously, as a woman here in New York City, Definitely, we need some protection. Um, I have two questions. The first question is you stated there's a Bluetooth option. What is the Bluetooth attached to? How, do I, how does that work? So um, there is a FOB option where you can track, for example, your phone or your wallet, which is already in the market. But what I'm hoping to do is to create an app that once you are either A, attacked or do not feel safe, you can open your app and ping your location of where this happened, similarly to the Citizens app, right? Except this would be for a niche community, for example, women in New York City. That's where I would like to start off with because I think that we are a vulnerable group who deserves to have a group of people on an app catered to them. And um, through this app as well, I would, for example, if you put in a zip code, let's say the Bronx 10463, you could, for example, get the Bronx DA's office or an enough and is enough coordinator there. But if you typed in 11001, you can be connected to the Long Island's DA's office or strangulation advocate or places that you can reach for immediate shelter. Okay, all right, thank you for yeah. explaining that. I have a daughter who lives in the city, so thank you for your efforts here uh, and, and great presentation. Thank you. Could you explain again that somebody uh, attacks you, you spray paint them, then what happens if, how do we track them from there? Good point. So um, I'm hoping after you spray this person, this is supposed to make them immediately marked, like you're marked so everyone around you knows that that person is doing something, but I want it to wear on the, the fob, you click a button, and I want it to either be able to A, call 911 through your phone, or B, like I said, sorry I didn't explain it well, through the app, once you press the button, it pings your location on the app so people know where you are regardless. Okay, and, and then that- I'm still that trying to engineer that. That identification of the spray paint, the person runs away, that would identify that person to authorities and as, as the attacker. Yes, and um, I guess I have a new idea. Maybe I could look into something with the app and a camera function, like once you press the button, if right. someone's attacking you, um, maybe we could take a picture of the attacker. Got it, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have one quick question. Yeah. The spray paint, is it like, we talked about the paint in the bank, that paint doesn't come off. Does this paint, how quickly would someone be able to wash this paint off and not be identifiable? This anymore? is a great question. So when I contacted Machine Studio, who is based in um, Las Vegas, I will say they have not said of whether they want to do it or not. We're in the beginning stages. This is real spray paint that people use for graffiti. So this is not gonna come off the person once you spray them. Um, I didn't see in your presentation, perhaps I missed it, um, some kind of either profit loss statement or how much money you're going to need to get this venture off the ground. Um, so, uh, like I said, it's going to be about $7 to produce each product, and I'm looking to sell uh, the aluminum version from Machine Studio for $24.99. Um, right now, I just have the profit of that, which would be $18, so I know that I would have to do more calculations for that. But right now, I just know the profit that I would get from an individual product. Sorry. There's no repellent chemical in the product, right? Is that the case? It's, it's paint. It's paint. Okay. Um, so. 
If this gives any insight, my NYPD na uh, narcotics detective father actually told me that spray paint was the biggest way that they actually marked people. Sure. Um, I'm wondering if your messaging wouldn't be misleading if folks are understanding this to be a defense or a mace alternative, which is a repellent. You know, it'll make someone want to stop doing what they're doing. This, I mean, would make them just make it known, identifying them. Well, if uh, you spray it in their eyes or mouth, it has a very similar effect to mace. Okay. A very similar effect. And is that, I mean, is that the message? I, I just want to make sure that the message that you're presenting as a self-defense so, product is what folks are receiving. I understand. So the mission statement is to have a Bluetooth self-defense weapon to bring together women and also protect them. So yes, it can be a Bluetooth device to ward off attackers, yeah. I have tried to buy mace for my daughter who lives in New York City. It is difficult. Agree. I also do have Mace, I don't know your competitive landscape. Mace, the company, because it's pepper spray, Mace is the brand, has this because I have one of these. Mm -hmm. But I think it's amazing your thought behind making it a Bluetooth product that this also not just makes noise against my assailant, but also contacts someone at the same time. And that could be compared to Life Alert. I know right. that could be Correct. considered a competitive, that could be an, uh, sorry, competition, but that is for an older niche audience. So I think that's an amazing point you brought up because I think this would be good for younger women and also women in college. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Slay them away. Here, here are your here are your cards. No, no, no problem. Um, as we move on, uh, next up we'll, we will have as the judges are putting in their scores right now. Our next presenter will be Carbon Clear, um, presented by by Ferris Al Alaba Alabi <laughs> Alabi. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, as we still figure out our technical issues with our international student um, will be our final pitch. Okay, and we, are, we are almost there and the clicker is here. All right. Um, hello everyone. My name is Faris al -Labi. I'm a civil engineering major. Today, I will be presenting for Carbon Clear as the entrepreneurial lead. Every year, millions of people are affected by the devastating consequences of air pollution, from health complications to environmental degradation. Uh, jurisdictions like New York City have been implementing uh, laws to mandate strict emission reduction targets. Today, I want to shed a light on the, down on the pressing issue of um, of, of the pressing issue on faced by building owners on the daunting challenge of complying with regulations like Local 97 with the lack of, of, of efficient solution and affordable solutions. Local Law 97 requires big buildings to cut their emissions by 50% in 2030 and 80% in 2050. Otherwise, building owners would be uh, receiving hefty fines, as you could see on the graphs. Uh, uh, the law started to be in, in effect in 2024 that made the market demand for those ambitious measures go in an all-time high. From building owners to contractors to environmental consultants, everyone is scrambling away to find solutions to reduce those emissions. Uh, current solutions usually provide either uh, electrification of boiler or retrofitting old buildings, which is expensive and not feasible. Here comes our solution, the carbon clear technology. Our system intake polluted air it would go through our passive chemical bonding with CO2, as well as would capture and separate the carb captured carbon. The remaining of the uh, air would go through the filtration system, which will uh, go through our particulate matter filtration system and exhaust carbon-free, particulate matter-free air and clear air. Our uh, initial prototype was in a controlled system, was able to slash the carbon CO2 levels uh, over a half in under 100 seconds, 
And our second prototype was a much bigger, much more advanced uh, prototype that we were working with Mount Sinai to deploy on a, ca to deploy on a case study uh, over the next two weeks. Um, our solution would uh, enable building owners to comply with regulations as well as trade captured carbon, which will, will uh, either as the physical captured carbon or the carbon credits as a way to sell them, as well as reduce emissions uh, and lead building owners to receive uh, lead certificates and other tax cuts, as well as cost integration, scalable solution, and it also purifies air, which is a huge advantage and a huge value for affordable housing agencies like NYCHA. Our product, so the carbon care technology would come in with a real-time air quality data showcase and as well as uh, automatic detection of uh, CO2 levels, which will allow for a variable carbon capture uh, for m better efficiency. So the system won't be running for 24 seven, only when it detects a high CO2 levels and it will be start running and going from that, that point. That reports and performance and carbon credits for also um, huge features of our system for air quality monitoring. Uh, we will have two versions of the product. One of them is the Carbon Clear Mobile, which is basically a deployable version of the system that will be uh, used for outdoor and indoor use. And then the Carbon Clear system, which is uh, integrated into HVAC systems. The product cost. So the Carbon Clear Mobile would cost, us, uh, would cost around 1000 to $2,000 per unit, while the production cost would cost around 600 to $700 with a profit margin of 56%, while the Carbon Clear system is a more higher P&L with a scalable uh, system, which will be um, integrated f into buildings starting from thirty to $50,000, and it could go north of $100,000 for bigger buildings. Um, it will be a service and protection cost of seven to fifteen thousand dollars that includes integration, design, and engineering work, uh, with a higher profit margin of sixty to seventy-six percent. The revenue streams comes in as restocking of the capturing formula from the carbon clear technology, as well as the thirty. We take a service fee of thirty percent from each carbon credit uh, being sold. Uh, Tesla has made two billion dollars over the last year only from selling carbon credits and as well as freemium data reports as well. Uh, our total addressable market comes in as a $84 billion value that 2022 from global air pollution control systems. Our so serviceable addressable market comes in with from $2 billion for 50,000 uh, 50, commercial buildings in New York City affected by local law 97. And then for, for the first two year, Carbon Clear aims to capture 0.04% of the SAM, which would be 800,000 for 15 buildings. Market adoption. Carbon Clear has been hard in work in integration and um, collaborating with many organizations from public for, to federal to city agencies and also engineering firms. Um, all of these environmental consultants to so contractors will act as our customer channels. Environmental consultants would do environmental assessment and they would recommend us to the customers and the building owners. Contractors like VRF Solutions have been open to adopt our technology into their contracts and uh, to their um, building contracts at the moment. Environmental health agencies would act as customer channels, the same thing as city agencies and federal agencies. Why Carbon Clear? Existing solution uh, usually are just mainly capturing carbon and our solution is more of a passive carbon car uh, solution. The passive uh, element of it would allow our system to be more scalable and integrable to old buildings, new buildings, and more variety of buildings. The current carbon, carbon capture technologies are for big buildings and for um, expensive and not feasible for a lot of building owners. This is the talented team that brought you Carbon Clear, and thank you for everyone for listening. What are you going to do with the carbon? So there is two options. One, we could dispose of the carbon if it's not feas logistically feasible for the building owner to ship that carbon out and still sell it as carbon credits or we could sell it as a potassium carbonate unit, which will be, could be used by manufacturers to make a lot of uh, products like soap and other uh, things. So it's a revenue for them to be selling the carbon as well. Have you penciled out the um, 
the cost comparison of investing in your product, the carbon capture, and just um, con like converting to uh, systems, heating and air conditioning systems like that, that don't that don't yes. consume fossil fuels. Yes. So for which there's a lot of sub the city with local law 797, mm -hmm. the city and the state have made a number of financing options available for mm -hmm. buildings for that purpose. Mm -hmm. A lot of those old buildings are very expensive to retrofit them. Sometimes it's not feasible at all, even with the money. So it would be sometimes even better for them just to skin with the f uh, stick in with the fines. But for uh, when it comes to the opportunity cost and the investment on that, we also provide not just to uh, introduce the same solution or the same service, which is the boiler or whatever it was. We include more... Um, value and becomes uh, purifies air. For example, NYCHA buildings are in an extensive challenge right now to purify the air within their buildings to provide better air quality, but instead of adding a separate system for that, they only could do one um, carbon clear system and it would they hood both things with the same thing. And I would say as well that our solution is very scalable to the point it's a module to be added to their existing system. In that sense, it's a lot cheaper for them just to add this module rather than switch the entire system out to the new system. Um, it could be fit into an existing HVAC or uh, the exhaust of a boiler system. It's literally just a module. You're welcome. Is the technology, is it patent, this technology? So the, the IP, the, uh, inter the IP is a design IP. So the, the technology that we use, the chemical bonding, is from a uh, research paper outside of uh, Washington, Washington University. But our IP comes in from a design IP, which we, the six engineers we worked on, we designed it for the efficiency of deploying that technology and how we could integrate it into that tube into that product. But what they use the uh, chemical bonding for was for huge factories, actually. We just make it scaled it down to a, to a more. Two things. Could you comment on capacity, uh, number one, and maybe expand on the relationship with uh, the hospitals? It at Sinai? Mount Sinai? Yeah, why don't yeah. you start there and tell us about that. So the Mount Sinai, uh, they have, so they have been, their environmental health um, justice program, they have been working on with the Jamaica bus depot at Queens. They have 27 households who are getting affected by the MTA constructions right next to them. So they were reached out to us and we collaborated with them to start deploying our product to, s to filter through the CO2 and the particulate matter through the air into the 27 households. We are currently under the talk of how can we do feasibly do that with the, how much it is gonna cost. We're gonna deploy our first, the second prototype, the big one. I wish we had it today, but it was hard to bring in here. It's kinda big. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're gonna bring it there. We're gonna deploy it there, collect the data on how much uh, we could you know, filter through. And then there's uh, serious talks about getting the MTA to purchase 27 of them to, for the 27 households, or there's gonna be a lawsuit because the air quality levels over there are atrocious. Um, yeah, and for the capacity, you mean like the capacity of what? The unit. So Not the mobile unit, but the, the scalable, mobile yeah. Mobile so it's a tough question because it's scalable. It depends on the building size and the how big is the system. Um, we What we actually gonna use for the, the money if we get in, we gonna use it for uh, actually getting actual numbers and statistics of the scalability of it, like how big it is and getting the numbers for a control system for a bigger uh, sized uh, prototype. Our s control system was a small one. We were able to afford to make it because it was small, but the bigger ones with the more variety of it, we need a bigger system with bigger funding. One source of things that we're trying to get to there is actually through EPA grants and we collaborated directly with Manhattan College with the faculty and we got a principal investigator. We applied to a NPA, an EPA grant and we are also looking for another EPA grant uh, from Fordham University and Thriving Communities that is due in two months. So we can, we're working on that as well. But that one is much bigger. But this is the same message that we were trying to get as well our product is for the people. It helps a lot of the people, as well as the building owners. So 
our message and our goal is shared between federal agencies, city agencies, and other um, agencies. So we align a lot with them. So that works well with our the product development and the research and development. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ferris. Thank you, Carbon Clear. Uh, now we're going to try again uh, with uh, Gerard online to see how this works out. As, as the judges make their final scores, Gerard? We figured it out. We figured it out. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Troubleshooting. <laughs> Great skill. So as the judges are putting in their final scores, we'll have Gerard um, with Redo presenting from abroad, from Spain. Where, where in Spain are you? Okay, great. Where's uh, what time is it? Is it like midnight, eleven thirty? Right now it's twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. Okay, so staying up to twelve thirty to pitch in the innovation challenge. Great. So now, judges, are you ready? Are we waiting one more minute? So. Yep. There we go. So, Gerard, the floor is yours. Gerard, Gerard, Gerard. He's got to speak slower because we're losing him. Gerard? Yeah? Just a little bit slower. A little bit slower so the so judges can. We're losing it. It's muddying up. For because just because of the translation, just a little bit slower in your presentation, you ha you'll have. We'll give you a little bit more than six minutes. You just go a little bit slower. Okay. Okay. Should I start again? Then? Sure. Yeah, you can start over again. Just a little, just a little bit slower. Dyslexia is actually a very common learning difficulty that affects the ability of processing language and reading and writing. Uh, as you can see from the list, it has nothing to do with intelligence, but it's a huge disadvantage when you face the educational system. In fact, one in every five people has dyslexia. And, sorry, uh, one, in fact, one in every five people has dyslexia. But one of the biggest issues is that 90% of them don't actually know they have dyslexia. So, time that we have been translated into the school paper last year in Spain, 69% of the school dropouts were experienced with dyslexia. And uh, from a story we have done in Spain, also, uh, all of the teenagers that uh, we have experienced that we uh, considered that uh, only the most given were the challenge. For that reason, we have to be able to solve the challenge. A solution for those that are really going to be offered for them. And it is meant to be a, a change in the 
Integrated Educational Reviews by providing a engaging and personalized tools to make learning accessible and fun. This is Redu, for me to understand it better, uh, it's, really better. Uh, it's like Duolingo, the same concept of play as you learn the language, but instead of learning the language, you will improve your detective dyslexia. So we have created Only one input, but I like to show the, the app and 
Can he hear us? Gerard, can you hear us? So dyslexia, my understanding is, there we go. My understanding is that dyslexia is somewhat on the eye of the beholder that each dyslexic has a different interpretation of whatever they're looking at. Is that true? So then, do you envision this product somewhat like AI learning for the individual student and get betty, getting better? Or like, how is it going to impact two different types of students? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gerard, hi. Uh, it was difficult understanding um, the presentation uh, just from the sound. It just in in two hundred words, what does what does this do, and how does it work? That's great. Thank you. Hi. Great product. Very uh, interesting. So this is secondary education. I'm sorry. It was hard to understand. So you had a presentation up, but you showed some age groups. You had 12 plus or where, what age is this? You said teenagers. This is 13 to 18. What age group is this? Okay, so it's per, that age group is how the game will work for Duolingo, like a Duolingo. And then you're gonna filter that to the schools. I'm sorry, you're gonna filter that to the schools, to the teachers that are in the schools that these students are attending to help them with their everyday lessons. Is that how I understand that? Yes. Okay. Ah, 
parents. Okay. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I actually just got the answer to my question. I was going to ask who the in consumer is, and my understanding is it's the parents who are, pa who are paying for this. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you from 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 Spain. Again, trying some trying something new. <laughs> Our international innovation challenge. Um, right now, that concludes all of. Thank you, thank you, Gerard. We'll we'll get we'll get back to you. Um, that concludes all of the pitches. Right now, the judges will be deliberating on seeing who will be first, second, third place winners. Uh, I guess Dean Gibson, you'll be taking them over to deliberate. Um, during that time, after Dean Gibson comes back in deliberation, uh, they will be the audience favorite. So right now, you can stretch your legs, have something to drink. Um, for the next 10 minutes or before, while the judges are deliberating on what are the next, um, who are the winners are.
Testing. You good? Okay. Um, okay, let's go. Are we good? How, how, are you, how are you guys feeling? You know, there's, there's some amazing ideas. You yeah. know, there's some amazing ideas. Um, we feel good about our product. I'm happy to squeeze out this video, right? All right. Better? Better? Can you come in? Yeah. You can step right Half the base step. Left? Better step? No, you can go right there. Okay. Noah Oliver, chips, <laughs> chips and flower seeds. Um, great presentation. Really, really seeing the work and the development that you both have put in from from the initial, from the um, from the semifinals. I would say one of my questions I have for you is like, what did you learn during this process of building the, your presentation for the innovation challenge? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> as we had started it, we were kind of just focusing on the sunflower seeds, and when we had spoke to you. Um, we saw how much more it could be than just a sunflower seed company. And I think uh, with our presentation, we tried to show that um, with it's not just a sunflower seed company, but uh, you know this could be some type of movement as well with, with that underdog feeling and that mentality. Yeah, um, after our meeting with you, that was kind of when we all came together, Oliver and I, and we were like, okay, we're going to do this chip on the shoulder. You know, we're going we're gonna to run with it, um, that we're with all the underdogs. You know, whether you're a baseball player, um, you know, chewing your sunflower seeds, or you're just your average Joe, you know, everybody's an underdog out there, and we want to build the brand and build a community of thriving for those underdogs to succeed. Other question: Have you tested uh, the chip on your shoulder yet with with uh, family, friends, and how's how has that been received? So, do you want me to? Yeah, yeah you got. It. Um, yeah, so we have uh, mainly just within our team and with our family, as it's still kind of like in the making, um, and they think it's a great idea. We actually created um, merchandise with a sunflower seed on the shoulder, so we thought it was kind of a little funny ad that um, you know. Anyone? Yeah, right. That you, that you do have that chip on your shoulder, and that's kind of that brand is like you know whether even if you don't like sunflower seeds, you know you could still um, have that chip on your shoulder and promote it every day. Yeah, they pump. I mean, <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. How you doing? doing good. How, 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 what do you think? What do you think? I really like this. Okay. I'm doing more often now. Well, like I said, you, you come next year. Come, come next year. Come next year. Uh, we, we might be trying to do a high school innovation. So may, maybe. Let me know when you're re ready. Good. So, so we have here Cardinal Hayes. You know, we expanding our partnership with Manhattan College. Um, you know, height Cardinal Hayes guy, man. Or, uh, what, what do you think, Cardinal Hayes guy, Cardinal Hayes man? Hayesman, sorry, sorry, Hay Hayesman. Um, again, I think it's really important for us to engage outside of the four walls of the institution to really show high school students about entrepreneurship, what do student entrepreneurship look like. Um, what are your thoughts about the innovation challenge and what do you like, um, what do you feel? Um, I'll start off. Uh, I'm the moderator for the business club at Cardinal Hayes. Uh, we are expanding our financial and business curriculum, and this club is in its first year. To be able to come to something like this and expose our students to uh, the ideas of these students who have <laughs> been remarkable and started these companies and have these ideas. Um, Roberto here has his own entrepreneurial venture, so seeing someone not too far in age from him already achieved this is great and I look forward to uh, coming to more events like this and exposing our students to more. I think it's a great opportunity for them. And Yeah, on top of that, um, I am the founder of the Business Club. I am an entrepreneur myself 
and this event really it really like showed me from like an external perspective of what it's like to be an entrepreneur and more of like an investor in terms of like the overall idea generation and like pitching and like actually starting a business and i think that if like all our members are able to get this experience it's just a great opportunity to like learn like the actual like logistics of, of what it takes to start a business so i think that this overall idea is like great like as a founder myself i could use that two thousand dollars also <laughs> so i mean like might come here next year but overall it's just a great idea and i i love it so yeah Again, thank you both for, for coming and looking forward to expanding this relationship with, with Colonel Hayes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, it's, it's gonna be up for it's gonna be up for a while. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually, it's gonna be up for a while. Uh, can I grab you just for all quick questions? Yeah, I don't know what to start saying. Here with Team Apparent, um, Teresa, you're, you're not, uh, you're very familiar with the Innovation Challenge. Uh, I guess from your perspective, how have you seen the Innovation Challenge grow um, over the three years that you have participated in it? Yeah, so I'm, this is my third year participating in the challenge, and I definitely think the excitement for the Innovation Challenge has grown across campus, particularly as we see people across like different majors and in different schools get more involved with it. Originally, I thought like it was something that it was like solely for the business school, but even today we saw we have like engineers participating, people in IT, and I think that's what makes all these ideas come to life more and makes them more dynamic, is that like collaboration. So it's definitely grown from when I've started. Question for you is, with this being your first innovation challenge, um, what have you learned about just the collaboration on a startup idea? Um, what was that process like for you? Yeah, this was my first time collaborating on a startup idea or any kind of business idea. I think what I've taken away was there's so it's so multifaceted and there are so many different avenues that we have to evaluate prior to competition day. Um, obviously, we integrate the different sectors of business to put together marketing and economics and the financial well-being of our business. But I think also combining that with our creative abilities has been so exciting to really put together and bring to life. Thank you so much, Team Apparent. Thank you. Good? Okay. okay. Tyler, you're up. Okay. Are, are, we, are we good? Uh, we're good? We're good. Tyler from the House, the, the house of Tempo. Um, first innovation challenge. Um, we've seen a couple of fashion brands enter the innovation challenge before, I guess, but this being your first your first innovation challenge, like what did you expect and, and what was that feeling being presented? Um, I was expecting, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I was expecting some other, you know, closer to innovative ideas in terms of like maybe something that would be more beyond, you know, in some way. I think some were really good and I think some kind of would need some polishing, but at the same time, I think for what I was doing, I felt maybe like, oh, okay. I'm maybe there some way because you know I was like okay to me it seems very simple and casual for something as innovative like this but for other people I can see probably that they're expecting like maybe a spaceship that goes to the moon or something um, so I kind of looked at mine and was like okay maybe it's somewhat good but you know coming to the competition I kind of saw a lot of people that maybe could have used a little bit extra work but I also saw some people that had some really good ideas that I thought were really gonna go somewhere uh, second, second question for you is, what advice would you give to other students who are thinking about the Innovation Challenge? Um, I say do your research. Um, that's a really big thing that I did myself was talk to other people, not just friends, but just first talk to people who are in the industry that you're looking at and then as well talk to you know, potential people that would actually purchase your product. 
you know, look at not just as a friend group, but as go beyond that. Go out to consumers and look at what would you prefer, what would you look at so you can tweak and understand what the consumer wants rather than what you're hoping to pitch to them without any valuable traction. Thank you, Tyler. What was your major one more time? Uh, mass MBA. MBA, but before that? Political science and psychology minor. Okay, okay. Um, let me know you're ready. So, Anna. Yes. So, happy to have you in the Innovation Challenge. Um, what was very interesting about your pitch is that, you know, for, coming from, from a political science and psychology major to creating a technology app, like, what was that uh, growth for you in terms of to presenting your, your startup? Uh, my role? Just, just in terms of your growth. Oh, my start. My apologies. Um, so majoring in political science, I was led under the direction of Dr. Chasek for Model UN, which really uh, grew my interest in advocation and um, speaking for people who don't typically have a voice. So I think that definitely fed to me wanting to make a difference. And then coupled with this psychology, um, that helped me better understand people, how to talk to them and give them more empathy. Um, it can be very hard to not understand where someone is coming from and then lose communication. That's very easy. So putting those together and then getting my MBA has been the most beneficial thing and I'm very grateful for Manhattan College because with the MBA, all the ideas I was having with undergrad, it brought it all together and said you can make a product that can help women who have been assaulted and for preventative measures. So um, that was kind of the route. And also working in IT under Quasi Bodkins. Um, he was a really great mentor um, last year for me when I was the GA. And just understanding how technology can connect people um, was really impactful. Um, and second question, like, what did you learn about yourself while developing this idea uh, for the Innovation Challenge? Um, I learned that I can compartmentalize um, and get through hard things with the support and also by having a passion project that gives me a reason to wake up and say, hey, I can actually make a difference in someone's life. So it also gave me my voice back. So, Thank you so much, Anna. It's Cole? It's Cole. Cole Alexander. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I need to speak to Paris. What do you think? Amazing. Great. The presentation was good. Presentation was good. Give me, give me one, give me one second. All right. Switch sides. Fair. So, um, being an engineering major and uh, building the startup, like, what did you learn about yourself during this process? It's definitely a huge learning experience. You would, uh, as an entrepreneur, you need to think more empathetically about other people and less like an engineer. So it's in a less technical way. You would need to think about customers. You would think, need to think about a lot of things. And that uh, value proposition and all of that, it changes the way you think sometimes. And it, g it makes you follow your bigger values better. And it's, it's, it's genuinely changing lives in that sense. Like that process of thinking when it comes to entrepreneurship changes things a lot when in every other aspect, especially in engineering, and it comes with startups and all. I totally understand, coming from a fellow engineer. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, okay, Ferris. You, okay. Okay. Do we have? All right, the judges have made their conclusions. Before we get there, we need to hear from you. The audience favorite is coming up. All right, is everyone ready? Does anyone in this room have a cell phone? Anybody? All right, so take out this instrument. Uh, even you, Fritz, cell phone. Remember that thing? Yeah. All right, are we ready? And those of you online, be sure to vote. We will start, all right. You either go to www.kahoot.it and enter that pin, or you can do that QR code, okay? www.kahoot.it and then enter, oh, Will, you were the fastest person in the room. Fa fantastic. The, <laughs> and the pin is 461-1414. I wonder who 
Ferez is going to vote for there. Welcome, Roberto. Prince. Prince. Nice. Quentin. Very good. All right. We are gathering votes. Mm-hmm. Ryan. Everybody in the room can vote. Everybody at home. Come on. Want to see a few more people? We're up to 25. Eddie. Nate. E. I like E. E could be anybody. All right. Gibson, I'm not voting. Who did that? <laughs> yes, we'll be announcing the audience favorite first. Okay? All right. All right, you have like 30 seconds. Oh, I like the eye patch guy. B, nice work. Okay, here we go. Okay, four six one one four one four. Okay, everybody ready? <laughs> All right, we're gonna start the vote. Here we go. In Innovation Challenge audience favorite, three, two, one. Mm -hmm. Which team is your choice for the winner of Innovation? Okay, get on with it. Okay, there it is. In the red, chip sunflower seeds. Gold, apparent. Then uh, sort of bluish, the House of Temple. Maybe that's taupe or something. Redo, really blue. Slay them away, green. And Carbon Claire is purple. As soon as you vote, it'll pop up there. Actually, at the end of 85 seconds, I think. All right, we have 46, 47 answers, 48, 9, 50. All right, I'm on the edge of my chair. Who's going to win? 55 seconds and 60 answers. Oh, we're up to 62. All right, we'll do the play-by-play. -play. That's right. Oops. Okay, you have to hide this until we're ready to go. All right, we have 74 in. Oh, wow, we give you all kinds of time. We have another 30 seconds. Wow, all right, I think we're getting some from online here. 82, 83. Oh my, the anticipation is killing me. All right. You have only 30, if you're still dithering about out there, you only have 11 seconds to go. All right, Fritz, did you vote? Okay, good. All right. Here it is with 88 uh, answers. The answer is, <laughs> oh, it looks like Chips takes it away. Wow, 49 for Chips. <laughs> I have a feeling the entire baseball team was on the case here. That is absolutely the way it works. So you are the audience favorite. When I have a moment, I will fill out your giant check for $1,000 for our audience favorite. <laughs> to Chips Sunflower Seeds. All right, Winston, are you ready to go? I think it's time for our third place winner. Sure. Yeah, as they win, then we get feedback. And actually, why don't we hear from Mike Kelly first while I organize the checks down here. Mike, Mike has some uh, motivational thoughts first. Speak into the, into the mic there. <laughs> so, I, you know, as in life, there's winners and there's losers in these kind of events. I think there's a couple important things to remember about entrepreneurship. The average entrepreneur in the United States is 37 years old. They are not 22. They did not just leave Harvard. So, and many ideas take a while to bake. You know, you have an idea, you come back to it, you put it aside. So if your idea didn't come to the top of the pile today, it's maybe not baked all the way. Thank but you. good luck to everyone.
Thank you for that insight, uh, Mike. Um, announcing the third, announcing the third place winner. Pay uh, off uh, this check. Our third place winner is actually uh, Redo. All the way from Spain. All the way from Spain. Our third place winner. Uh, congratu congratulations, uh, Gerard, while you're online. Um, we'll definitely connect a little bit later so you can get this check. I'll, I'll mail it across, across the pond for you. Very good. Oh, I was just going to. I was just going to add a little congratulations, Gerard, and add a little bit to what Mike was saying. Part of the experience of this competition is learning to be an entrepreneur and learning all the elements that go into a business. And in a lot of ways, it's that lesson is what you've already done, right, in building those businesses. And then developing those ideas over time are key. All right, it is time for our second place winner at 2,500. What have I got back here in my, it is, that's right, Chip Sunflower Seeds. <laughs> Chips, come on down. You get to hold the big check. All right, and I think we're going to hear from David, who's going to give a little feedback. Whoa. Really good job. Uh, I'm familiar with the uh, Vermont ecosystem and what it takes to, I lived in Shelburne in Burlington for 13 years. So what it takes to build an authentic product that is Vermont based, you hit a lot of the really good points, real syrup that you manufacture yourselves, uh, the, the product tastes good. And the, the feedback from all of us, I think, would be to focus on the younger kids. Um, <clears throat> we know our kids take candy, gum, this is a great alternative to that. Your target market of college baseball is really good. David seems to have the, the major leagues locked up. But if you start younger, uh, we think you could really make an impact there. So really nice job. Nice. Blow David's out of the water. <laughs> nice work. Good job. Congrats. And now I think we're time for first place. Winston, you want to do that one? And, uh, it seems like it was a, a tough decision for the judges to figure out who was the first place winner, but there's only only one, and the first place winner for the 11th annual Innovation Challenge is Carbon Claire. <laughs> Congratulations, Ferris. Uh, feedback from, from the judges? For us, it was um, really an outstanding presentation. Uh, and so congratulations, first off. Uh, and I can really only uh, nitpick at the, the presentation that you um, offered us. Um, one of the things that I would, I would, so you did a great job laying out the legislative la uh, landscape, talking about Local Law 97 and how that, not only the climate impacts of that, but the economic impacts of that um, related to um, building owners, uh, and that really set the set the stage for folks um, in in terms of your um, value proposition. The one thing that I think came up for the judges uh, that I would offer feedback on is um, backing up your claims around the costs associated with the product. Um, if you could provide more um, substantive uh, uh, support for for the costs that you're laying out. I think it would just strengthen your, your presentation a lot more and really level set the expectations around uh, revenue. Um, but, 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 uh, oh, wait. I think I forgot the redo feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's going to hear me, <laughs> but uh, congratulations to Gerard. I'm sorry, this was for my redo feedback that I thought it was a fantastic uh, presentation. I think there is definitely room for <coughs> growth for students a little bit younger for dyslexia because we know that in first and second grade 
that's really where it's um, very prevalent, but I think he did a fantastic job and I'm excited to see how this helps students going further in the U.S. when he launches in the U.S. So congratulations. Thank you. Now, before before the, the teams, I would like to get a group picture with all of the winners as well as the teams for the Innovation Challenge before before thing, before we depart. But we do have a couple. The judges, the judges don't see the next cut. The judges the, should be in the picture. The, definitely. Uh, judges are in the picture as well. Come on, come on, come on, come on. But. No, but again, we would like to have all of, all of the groups who participated, the judges up here as well for this 11th annual innovation challenge as well as Aileen. Aileen, come on, come, come on up, doing a lot of the behind the scenes work for the innovation challenge. Um, this, is a special, this is a special innovation challenge um, for, for me in terms of you know, having an international student coming, coming on board, having all of these different students from 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 all different disciplines. <coughs> okay, I mean, I'm, I'm good in the picture. Okay. Third, third. All of the participants. Yep. Like participants, I would lo love to have you in, in a photo. Let's thank everyone for coming. We want to thank everyone for coming. Let's give a final round of applause for all the participants. Thank you very much. And uh, this is kind of my last innovation challenge here at Manhattan College. So uh, it's been a great ride, let me tell you. Thank you for all your work on that. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Dean Ginson, for, for, for this journey that we've been on for the past couple of years for the Innovation Challenge. Um, it's bittersweet, but again, thank you for your leadership for the Entrepreneurship Program as well as the Innovation Challenge. You'll, you'll be missed. Um, wishing you all of the best on your next journey and more to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we have everybody. Come on, get in here. Okay.